Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to the second U.S. Sustainable Wine Growing Summit. I'm Allison Jordan. I'm the Executive Director of the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, and I've had the pleasure of working with the California vintners and wine growers for over the past two decades, first as we established the Alliance and its educational program, and then as we created Certified California Sustainable Wine Growing which is a third party certification program first launched for vineyards and wineries in 2010 and for wine in 2017. Over the past several years, we've cast our net more broadly across the United States and have been collaborating with the California, New York, Oregon and Washington organizations that you see listed here to promote sustainable wine growing and winemaking and to communicate about the industry's commitment to sustainability. It's this partnership that brought us to the summit today, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our initiatives in just a bit, few minutes. But I first wanted to cover some housekeeping, the, the normal Zoom housekeeping that we have to go through. Um, first, we'll be recording today's webinar, and all of you will receive an email with the link in the coming days. Um, please also note any questions you have throughout the day in the Q&A section, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And we'll get to as many of the questions as we can, but we'll also plan to respond to any remaining questions following the event. And then finally, you can use that chat section or chat button to interact with all of the other attendees. It does default to panelists only, so be sure to select all panelists and attendees if you're trying to reach everyone. So our sponsors um, really made this, this summit possible, and I really want to thank those who stepped up and supported the event. Um, yesterday, we had a chance to thank our tasting sponsors. So today, I'd like to acknowledge the summit sponsors. First, our exclusive media sponsor, American Vineyard Magazine, Protected Harvest, Deep Planet, Heron Hill Winery, Napa Green, and TerraView. We are so grateful to each and every one of these organizations for supporting the summit. So now to kick things off, I wanted to share a bit more information about our partnership, which we call United for a Sustainable Future. We came together in this multi-state, multi-year project to do a couple of things. So first, we wanted to develop a common definition and principles for sustainable wine growing and winemaking. We wanted to better understand trade and consumer interest in sustainability and the reason we're here, we also planned two sustainability summits to share best practices and lessons learned, really to benefit all of our US initiatives and even more importantly, to advance sustainable practices in each of our regions. And then we also wanted to be able to promote our sustainability commitment to trade media and consumers. Together, the California, Oregon, New York and Washington wine industries produce 95% of all US wine. And within each of these states, educational and certification sustainability programs have taken root over the past several decades. In this state alone, in California, which produces over 80% of California or of US wine, um, more than 80% of California wine is now made in a certified California sustainable winery. And more than half of our vineyard acreage is certified to certified California sustainable, low rare rules. Napa Green, SIP Certified, Fish Friendly Farming, and others. And there are other programs across the US, including Live, Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing, Salmon Safe, and others that are under development, not to mention, of course, Organic, Biodynamic, B Corps, all of these providing more evidence of the care for the environment and for people our vintners and growers have while producing world-class wines. And programs are tailored to local and regional conditions, which they should be from a sustainability perspective. And those grassroots efforts that create these programs and then that keep them going are really the foundation or, and are so essential. But we felt it was important to be able to better communicate about what these initiatives have in common. So together we created the de definition of sustainable wine growing and winemaking that you see here on the slide along with common principles. And it, these same concepts are really shared by the entire international wine industry. So we've developed a website, sustainablewinegrowing.us. I love that that's also us and a brochure. 
to share the definition of principles, which in turn can be shared with vintners, growers, trade, media, and consumers. So the next part of the project was consumer and trade research. And in 2019, we worked with Luli Halstead of Wine Intelligence. Many of you probably know her. Um, really to better understand consumer interest in sustainably produced and or certified wines. And she delivered the findings at our first summit in June 2019, and then updated those numbers again in 2020 to present at a webinar that we hosted last year. So just to hit on a few key findings, 71% of US drinkers indicated that they would consider buying sustainably produced wine in the future. Nine of 10 are willing to pay more for sustainable wine. And it's really those younger consumers, millennials um, and Gen Z of drinking age that view sustainability as increasingly important to protect their future. And they really have a strong affinity towards sustainable wine certifications. When it comes to sustainability certifications, they're not essential for all consumers, but they do help provide transparency and reassurance. Um, consumers are really looking for those, when they're looking for sustainable wine, they're looking for those clear and simple visual clues or ways to identify wine in the stores. On the trade side, um, we worked with Christian Miller of Full Glass Research in 2019, using some of you will know this, the Wine Opinions Trade Panel, to really look at trade perceptions of sustainability in wine. And we had actually worked with Christian on earlier research in 2016. So in some cases, we were actually able to compare data. And as you'll see here, sustainable practices are frequently or occasionally a factor when choosing a wine to market or sell to, to customers for 82% of trade respondents. Only 3% resp responded never. And you can also see here that the frequent pur purchases increased and the never or rarely responses decreased between 2016 and 2019. And then just a couple of other interesting data points. We wanted to know if trade thinks that sustainability is a growing trend. And if so, is it here to stay? 73% um, of the trade respondents felt the demand for sustainably produced products has increased over the past five to 10 years, and even more, 76% uh, think it will increase in the future. And finally, sustainability can offer a point of differentiation. So when asked all things being equal, 71% um, of the respondents said that they would purchase a sustainably produced wine over one that's not. As I noted, bringing us all together through sustainability summits as we are here today is really another important part of our partnership and one that I hope we'll be able to continue in the future. In 2019, we were able to meet in person. Of course, it was pre-COVID days and that was our inaugural summit. We focused a lot on sustainability education and communications and CDFA Secretary Karen Ross, who you see here was our keynote speaker and the event was held at the beautiful McMurray Ranch in Sonoma. We had hoped to be in person again, this time in Long Island, New York. And we, we made plans to be there actually twice, <laughs> but we're still grateful that we're able to meet virtually. And this time, perhaps, again, the silver lining is that we have a stellar lineup of speakers and even more of you could join us. We have hundreds of you from across the country and around the world. And I think our first summit, we had around 70 people from six states. So we're excited to see our audience broaden. And then the final piece of our project is communicating sustainability. So in addition to yesterday's tasting, of course, the summit, the brochure and the website I mentioned, each partner state is able to develop new materials or initiatives. And you'll likely hear about some of the plans in other partner states over the next two days. But in the case of California on April 1st, the first day of what we call a down to earth month, we launched a new website, californiasustainablewine.com. And the site allows trade media consumers and visitors who wanna find sustainable wines or wineries and vineyards um, to learn more about sustainability and to search for those um, wineries that they can visit as well. 
And it's really a great tool to educate folks about what it means to produce sustainably and in an environmentally and socially responsible way. So this will give you a sense of why we're here today and some of the activities that have been going on since the very first US Sustainable Wine Growing Summit. So it's now my great privilege to introduce Ray Isle, Executive Wine Editor of Food and Wine and the Wine and Spirits Editor for Travel and Leisure. We asked him to think about trends and observations and I'm really looking forward to hearing his perspective. So Ray, welcome and over to you. Great, thank you very much, um, Allison. And uh, and um, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. And and I'm I'm kind of actually in the context of all this talking about um, not being in Long Island. As you point out, we've got people from everywhere. I saw we've got people from Mexico and Lebanon and Singapore um, and many many states. And hey, our, our carbon footprint is very low as a result of that. So um, so that's a good thing. Um, so I I was going to talk a little bit. Um, I, I mean I I talked about uh, thought about this talk in the context of sort of looking forward in terms of sustainability of wine, but I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability in general to start with. Um, I did want to say thanks for inviting me to present this and thank you honestly to everyone who's out there who, who decided to join um, because it does take time out of your day and I really appreciate it. Um, so I thought in talking about sustainability in general and as well as sustainability of wine, I'd start with a couple of quotes to kind of bracket um, you know, where we started um, with sustainability as, as a kind of a, a movement or a concept and at least in context of wine and then kind of where we are now. Um, the first one uh, is quite famous, at least within the wine world. It's a comment that the soil microbiologist Claude Bourguignon made at a conference in Burgundy in the late 1980s. Um, he was speaking to the growers who were gathered there. And, and what he said was, um, if you carry on spraying, your soil will have less life than the sand of the Sahara Desert. Um, it was a pretty blunt statement. And, uh, and it didn't actually go over all that well at the time because a lot of people were spraying a lot of things on the Burgundian vineyards. But one, it had a pretty pronounced effect. And two, I do think of it as a kind of a turning point or kind of marker um, of the beginning of sustainability awareness, at least in wine. And it, it's interesting that that's right around the time of the United Nations Brundtland Report, which is 1987, Our Common Future was what it was called, which in many ways marked the kind of start of an international push towards sustainable development. Um, Moving forward, this other quote is from an email I received the other day, and I'll just read it to you. Um, you can add the exclamation points yourself. Um, Hi, Ray, this is Earth Day, or this Earth Day. Discover new sustainable habits and products with our incredible roster of eco-warrior brands. One of the most efficient ways to reduce your eco footprint in 2021 is to switch up your routines to include more environmentally responsible, sustainably sourced and all natural products and practices. Developing everyday habits that have the Earth's best interest in mind is a great opportunity for us to make a real difference because every little bit counts from biodegradable packaging and ethical manufacturing to sustainably sourced and all natural products. Our eco-conscious brands are here to help you go green. Um, obviously it's a PR pitch um, and I feel a little guilty about pulling it out, but I did receive 50 or 60 similar emails just in the past week or two, all kind of tied to Earth Day. Um, if I followed up on all of them, I would now be enjoying a uh, protecting and restoring clean face balm, uh, sustainably sourced age defying face oil, um, low waste packaged um, AOB volume shampoo in a flex pouch, uh, eco-friendly linen oversized dish towels, because apparently linen requires 20 times less water than cotton to produce, uh, an ethically produced shorty uh, silk camisole, which I would look absolutely fantastic in, I am convinced. Um, and let's see what else, biodegradable yoga mat, um, gin made with sustainable distilling processes, which actually won an EcoStar award and is pretty cool. Um, and I would be able to put them all in my quote, stylish new everyday bag, which has the environmental mission of helping people produce a new daily habit, do their part to save the planet and look good at the same time, end quote. And then I could take all that to the Casamigos curbside cocktails for conservation event, which is happening of course on Earth Day. Um, so, there is, <laughs> there's kind of a difference between that and Claude Bourguignon. At the same time, there's some similarities. Uh, I, I just got today, actually, a release um, about a new and, and actually intentionally awful tasting beer from Fat Tire Brewing. 
um, which is was which they came up with to make a point about climate change, um, which and then rolls into the entire realm of sustainability. Um, Fat Tire made it from smoked malts to point out the effect that wildfires will have on water supply and from drought resistant grains, basically millet and barley. And the point was to, to talk to sort of make people aware of what beer would be like if we keep on our present path. Um, it's called torched earth, which is pretty clever, and it tastes like crap, apparently, and that's the point, and that's pretty clever, too. And I think that made me think then of, of Lindsay, Hoop, Lindsay Hoops in Hoops Vineyard in Napa, who took her soot-covered grapes from the 2017 harvest after the fires, made them into a brandy, which, once it's done aging, she plans to sell out of her tasting room to create a kind of dialogue about sustainability and fire. And I wanted to say, try to bring up all those things to get people thinking about both, um, you know, how this sort of sustainability dialogue has, has changed over time, how it's moved into the realm of public relations, how it's also inspired great creativity in some ways, um, in many ways. And I'll say the takeaway is a few things. You know, first, um, Claude Bourguignon was right. Um, and the corollary to that to me is that, that the most important aspect of sustainability is actively practicing it because the effects of not doing so are very real. Um, secondly, this occurred to me that sustainability is kind of the opposite of fight club. You know, the classic fight club thing, the first rule of fight club is do you not talk about fight club? Well, the first rule of sustainability is that you actually have to talk about sustainability. You have to make people aware of what you're doing. You have to make people aware of the concept in the first place, but how you talk about it also matters. Um, and third, and this is not just based on the number of Earth Day pitches I received, um, consumer, and, 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 and talked about this a bit in the intro, um, consumer awareness of sustainability, and of all the words that surround sustainability, organic, natural, clean, biodynamic, I mean, clean, regardless of what you think about the term in terms of marketing, it's, it's out there, biodynamic, all the rest of those, awareness of those are at an all-time high, and that awareness is still growing, and that's very good because working sustainably and then convincing people to buy sustainably and to use their money to support sustainable efforts is vital. Um, I wanted to um, borrow a concept from uh, the Israeli historian um, Yuval Noah Harari. Um, some of you may have read Sapiens, his book. It's a terrific book, go out and buy it. Um, it makes you very aware of our role on the earth. But he he's pointed out that there's a reason that we as humans basically run the world. Um, we're the only animals, and this is, this is directly from him, the, the, we're the only animals, he says, that can cooperate both flexibly and in very large numbers. If you look at bees and ants, for instance, they cooperate in very large numbers, but they can't modify their social systems easily. Um, you know, they don't, they don't change. Um, they, they're, they have rigid structures. Social mammals like wolves or apes do cooperate much more flexibly, but only in small numbers and only sort of face to face. Humans can do both. We can, through cooperative effort, um, for instance, well, well, we can create a broadband internet network that supports an online video platform that then will allow 200 people to push a button wherever they are in the world and listen to me talk about sustainability. No other animal can do that. I mean, whether another animal would want to is another question, but <laughs> no other animal can. But in the context of sustainability and more to the point, um, and I can't actually recall if Ferrari says this as well, but I've, I've certainly thought it if he hasn't. Um, we're the only animal that through our facility for mass flexible cooperation can also potentially poison the entire earth, which basically puts us in line to be the first self-extincting species. It's just it's a very dubious honor. Um, that's another reason, that is the key reason why sustainability, whether in a vineyard or a winery or a wine region or literally everywhere else matters so much. Um, sustainability, by the way, the word comes from the Latin sustenere, to hold. And it gets to us by way of the old French sustenir, which means to hold up and bear, to suffer, endure. Um, in the time of, in the 14th century, um, it actually kind of was meant to, which was a time of plagues, not dissimilar from what we're in right now, endure without failing or yielding. Today, sustainability has two meanings. It's the traditional one, which is the sort of, you know, mechanical one, which is the ability to maintain at a certain rate or level. And the one we're talking about today, which is avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. If we don't avoid the depletion of natural resources on the earth, if we do not maintain the ecological balance of the earth, we are by definition unsustainable. Um, unsustainable is not a good thing 
to be. If you carry on spraying, your vineyard will have less life than the sand of the Sahara Desert. If we all carry on being unsustainable, the planet will have less life than the sand of the Sahara Desert. So um, that's, that's enough bleakness for the moment. Um, I think, uh, why don't we look on the bright side and the bright side of sustainability and wine. Um, there are radically more wine producers and grape growers working sustainably around the entire world than there ever were before. And that number is only increasing and that's incredibly heartening. Um, to give you a few examples, in October of 2012, um, about 12.3% of the vineyard land in California was certified sustainable. In 2019, that number was 32%. Um, and if you look at wine volume, the number is even better, um, about 254,746,893 cases of wine came from certifiable, certified sustainable grapes in, in 2019. That's 80% of California's total production. It's really kind of amazing. Um, uh, those, those numbers come um, from, of course, the organization putting on this event, CSWA. Um, but it's not just California. It, you can look in more closely. If you look at Sonoma, for instance, Sonoma County, the membership of the Sonoma County Wine Growers Association, thanks to a program they instituted a few years back, is 99% sustainable. I'm not sure who the holdout is, but you know, get with the program. Um, in, in New Zealand, 98% of the country's vineyards are sustainable, certified sustainable. Bordeaux, which has never been the fastest region to adopt change. In 2014, 34% of the total wineries in Bordeaux were farmed either organically, sustainably, or biodynamic certified. Today, that number is 65%, and they're on course to have 100% of the region's wineries which is 6,000 wineries, give or take, it's a lot of wineries in Bordeaux, running some kind of sustainable certified program by 2030. That list goes on, Chile, Australia, lots of other places. Um, I think someone yesterday said, and I, I think it was Evan Goldstein, I hope people managed to come to the tasting yesterday because it, it was terrific and Evan moderated it wonderfully. And I think he said that sustainability is the new normal. And to that I say, well, thank God it is because that's really great. And it's also pointed out yesterday and, and is inescapable that sustainability is not just limited to agriculture and to farming. It's much broader picture than that. Winery structures, for instance, are being built more sustainably than ever before. Recycled materials, solar and other forms of energy generation, rainwater harvesting, natural lighting to reduce energy usage, natural ventilation to produce energy usage. Again, that list goes on, using green cars or delivery trucks, using recycled paper for labels. Torres in Spain, which has done a ton of things in regard to climate change and also regard to sustainability overall. Uh, I love this. They use a solar powered train to take their tourists around the property. Um, you know, th there are bigger things they're doing, but that's, that's pretty cool. Um, social sustainability, of course, is also crucial. Um, that has taken many forms in the wine business, providing daycare for vineyard workers' children, uh, ESL courses for workers, donations to local nonprofits. Um, one great example of this is San Patrignano in Italy, um, which is a huge estate. Um, they employ recovering drug addicts, not just to make wine, but also cured meats, olive oil, leather goods, a huge range of products, um, all that come from the estate. Over 26,000 people have worked there since 1978, um, essentially you know, re doing rehab as they have worked creating wine. It's community-based community approach. It treats, you know, it treats that community as in a sustainable way that helps people at the same time. They also happen to produce very good wine. And then there's carbon footprint. Um, Thankfully, there's some movement on this, um, and certainly there's been movement in terms of wineries using green vehicles and so on. A huge amount of carbon footprint for wine, of course, is shipping and, and, and literally bottles. And uh, several years back, for instance, Champagne reduced the standard Champagne bottle weight from 900 grams to 835 grams, which doesn't seem like that much. But by 2018, that reduced the Champagne region's overall carbon footprint by 20%. That's about 8,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, on the other hand, we haven't completely solved this problem yet. I was tasting the other day, yesterday, in fact, in the office, and <laughs> was struck by two very different bottles, both 750 mLs. Um, so I took them home and weighed them. And, um, and I'm not going <laughs> to call out the, the bad guy here, but, but one of them weighed 13 ounces and the other weighed 43 ounces. That bottle was two pounds. was over two pounds. It's a two-pound bottle, and it came to me from South America by air. 
And that is um, not sustainable. And I think recently Jancis Robinson on her site has started pointing out weights of, of possibly bottle weight offenders, which probably annoyed some people, but I think it's kind of brilliant. Um, and then there's a kind of a, a, another crucial point, which was first articulated to me um, several years back by Tegan Pasolacqua, who's the winemaker for Turley, um, winemaker for Turley Vineyards, and also, I mean, in my opinion, one of California's great vineyard gurus. We were driving around Lodi and talking about sustainability and organics. And he said, you know, one thing people forget is that you can be as sustainable as you want, but if you're not economically sustainable, it doesn't matter because you go out of business and then you're not being sustainable because you're not doing anything. So with that last one, last note in mind, I wanted to talk a little bit about wine and sustainability and consumers. Um, so it's interesting, you know, I, I, I admit, I, I somewhat shamelessly made fun of that PR pitch um, at the start of, of, of what I was saying, um, which, you know, and, and those products are actually trying to do something good. And it's, and it's not the, you know, it, yes, the PR pitch was a little over the top, but um, nevertheless, not a bad thing to point out. Um, interestingly, here's a stat. Um, this is from the Financial Times in England back in November. So there was a survey conducted in October by the UK's Public Relations and Communications Association. And they found that 69% of their respondents had been asked to publicize green or social or governance messages in the last year. I guess the number is probably pretty similar in the US. Why do companies decide to make a change towards publicizing something like green initiatives? Because they think consumers want it and because they think they will make money if they do publicize it. And with sustainability, they're right. Consumers are interested and they will make more money, in fact. Um, you just hope that there are some companies that simply use it as a marketing technique, but we're going to concentrate on the companies that really do something. Um, I want to toss out a few more statistics, so you know, bear with me here. Some of these echo what um, I said in the introduction. Um, in 2019, a Nielsen report noted that the majority of global consumers, 73%, said they would definitely or probably change their consumption habits to reduce their impact on the environment. Um, sales of consumer products in the US um, with sustainable attributes made up 22% of store sales. Um, this is again, this is 2019. 2020 threw some wrenches into things with the pandemic and, and data accumulation and so on. Um, though from every report I've seen, it didn't actually if, uh, lower people's interest in sustainability, maybe even raised it. Um, also in 2020, the NYU Stern School of Sustainable, for Sustainable Business noted that while in the four years leading to 2019, only 16% of consumer goods products in the US were marketed for their sustainability, those products accounted for half of the consumer goods sector growth. So even when sustainable products aren't necessarily the majority of products in the market, they are, they are producing an enormous amount of growth. Um, to look at food and wine, since I work at food and wine, makes, makes, makes sense to me. Um, I don't actually have specific stats on readers and sustainable wine, unfortunately, because we haven't tracked that. But for food and wine readers, we have tracked interest in, um, in food interest in food. Of course, we track interest in food. Um, <laughs> there, there are about 6 million food and wine readers. 56% um, of them regularly eat organic food. 61% eat more organic products than they did two years ago. Only about 49% cite the environmental impact, impact as the reason for that decision, though that's still almost half. Um, health benefits actually come in higher. But it's a substantial number of people. And when it comes to a range of sustainable actions, from choosing reusable grocery bags to composting leftovers to decreasing the use of plastic wrap to paying attention to whether the foods they purchase are sustainably produced, 94% of our readers are doing at least one of those things or, and often several. Um, I mean, obviously food and wine readers are interested in food and they're interested in wine and they probably skew towards the green side, but even so not all of them do. And that's a huge percentage of our readers who become sustainably aware, I guess you'd say. Um, so there's, there's one word I haven't mentioned yet that, that comes up in every single talk like this, and I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it now, which is um, millennials, um, you know, the millennial world word. So if we go to Nielsen again, and I think this was mentioned at the start, you know, millennials, about 75% are more likely than baby boomers at 34% to say that they are probably or definitely changing their habits to reduce impact on the environment. 
90% of millennials said in that 2019 Nielsen study that they are willing to pay more for products that contain environmentally friendly or sustainable ingredients. Baby boomers are down at 61%. And I love the fact that boomers like to characterize the criti criticize the character of millennials as being sort of un, you know um, uh, self-involved and so on. And it's like, I don't know, man, 90% of millennials are gonna pay more for environmentally friendly products and boomers 61% um, bear some thinking. 86% of millennials say they would pay more for products with organic and natural ingredients. 80% said they pay more for products with social responsibility claims. Baby boomers were 59 and 48 on those respectively. And as usual, the study apparently does not say a damn thing about Gen X. I mean, you know, there are only 65.2 million Gen Xers in the US. Why would we care about what they think? They might as well not exist. Um, somewhat personally offended. <laughs> now to me, for wine, this is actually though where it gets really interesting because the Nielsen exec quoted on these stats also said, the generational divide is fueled by technology. We found that sustainable shoppers in the US are 67% more likely to be digitally engaged. Their devices play a significant role in their purchase decisions. And then recently I was interviewing Mike Osborne who's the EVP, executive vice president at wine.com. And I was, I'm doing a story um, which will be out in a couple of months because we work far ahead um, about kind of the, the boom in digital um, online wine sales um, that partly propelled by the pandemic, but it's a curve that's been going on um, for a while. Um, Mike said, you know, our mobile app is frequently half of our business. And millennials who made up 44% of our new customers in 2020 are much more likely to use their app to make a purchase. And going back again to the NYU Stern research, one thing they found is the younger the household, again, the younger the household, the more likely they are to buy sustainability marketed products. So you think about this, you know, have millennials lived up to the kind of general wine industry hope of there being the greatest wine gen buying generation ever? Um, no, they haven't, at least not yet. But are they an enormous segment of the population that's headed into prime earning years with an inescapable interest in sustainable consumer goods? Yes. And have online and delivery sales of wine already seen steady growth for several years and then basically had rocket packs attached to them during the pandemic, the online sales were out of control. Um, and are millennials more comfortable with and likely to buy products online than any other generation? Sort of discounting Gen Z, we haven't gotten there in terms of them buying wine yet. Yes. So. If you look at that combination of ongoing growth in online wine sales combined with millennial interest in sustainability and social responsibility, I think that's something you'd be completely crazy to ignore as a sustainable wine producer. It's not the reason to be sustainable, but it's an insight into how to sell sustainable wine. You have to communicate what you're doing though. Um, I talked to Rob Allen, who's the managing director of Zaki's Fine Wine in New York about this and he said a couple of interesting things to me he said you know we've seen a growing interest definitely in in green wines I, he they he said he produced their first catalog on green wines in 2010 you know what is organic viticulture was biodynamic who are these guys what are they up to at the time he said i thought it would really really resonate with people it didn't not zero uptake in sales now he says they're definitely seeing more sales and he said so much so that I'm putting CPC, which is digital ad dollars behind it on our site. I'll buy those keywords as a marketable, marketer, sustainable, organic to drive people to us. And I never would have done that in 2010. The next thing he told me though really resonated. He said, we see more engagement with it than ever before. But if you have the conversation you, where you say, well, the grapes are organically farmed, but the winemaking is still not certified organic because organic certification for winemaking is different from organic certification for grapes, um, but it does have sustainable certification at the same time, people's heads just start to spin. I like this quote from him. He said, wine is still such a mystery product for a lot of people anyway. They're already in the store slightly baffled by wine. And then with organics and sustainability, it's one more layer of confusion. So it's deeply contingent on the wine industry to get that message out there in a clear way. Um, in fact, I mentioned I was doing this talk to him and he said, I would, I would love for the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance Group to reach out to us and help us bring that concept of sustainability to the market. Um, so, you know, there you go, CSWA, that's your mission. And this message and your computer will self-destruct in five seconds. Um, I'm running a little over, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull back for a second because 
let's sort of look at sustainability broadly again, because when it comes to sustainability, all of the three E's, which is environment, equity is in social equity and economic, are crucial when it comes to sustainability. If it's, it's, a, it's a chair with three legs. If you pull one out, it falls over. And even if you make it out of recycled materials, it does that. So I just thought I'd run through a couple of recent approaches that sort of point a way to, you know, uh, new approaches to sustainability I haven't run into before. Um, at Elahe Winery in Oregon, they make a, and this is not necessarily expandable, but it's kind of fascinating. They make an 1899 Coupe Pinot without any modern equipment, fossil fuels, or electricity. It's a little bit of a stunt, but it's a very intriguing one. They then use a mule powered stagecoach and five canoes to get it to Portland so they can put it into the sail stream. Um, this is kind of fascinating. Borgolucci in Italy uses biomass boilers and a biodigester to turn manure and waste into biogas, which then supplies all of their electric and thermal energy, all of it. Um, Cowhorn in Oregon is the first winery to achieve living building challenge certification, which is sort of like lead on steroids. It requires net positive or net zero energy, toxin-free building materials, lowering your carbon footprint many times below the standard commercial structure, and then observation for 12 months before you could possibly pass. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, back in the realm of the quirky Chateau Smith Eau Lafitte in Bordeaux, among many other sustainable strategies, captures CO2 from fermentation and converts it to sodium bicarbonate, which they then sell to pharmaceutical companies for use in toothpaste. I mean, it's kind of wild. It's just a random sampling. But I would say in the end, you know, all of this comes back to how we as a species play our role on this planet, how we should play our role. The earth, you know, was around a long, long time before humans ever started talking to one another. It's going to be around a long, long time after we're gone. And, and unfortunately, if we don't get our act together, that could be sooner than we like by a lot. Um, and, you know, I think of this, I, I, I was thinking about this and I thought of an Italian winemaker um, who once said to me that his vineyard had been in his family for several hundred years. It's not something we get to pull off in California that often, but, um, but he said, you know, he, he considered himself to just be taking care of it so that he could hand it off to the next generation. It wasn't his vineyard. It was it was it was a something that had been entrusted to him to then pass along. And as everybody who's on this call knows, we're going to hand off our planet to the next generation. And so, I mean, let's not turn the whole thing into the Sahara. Um, and as I was thinking of that, it made me think of another Italian winemaker. And I'm not sure, honestly, why it's always Italian winemakers who give me these insights. But you know, in this case, it was Sergio Matura who makes, um, it's, not, it's not very well known, but he makes gorgeous um, Orvieto and Lazio, farms organically. And several years ago, we were walking through his vineyards, talking about organic, organic viticulture in his case, um, and he does sustainable things as well. And he said to me, you know, why would I spray my vines with pesticides? My children go out and they play in those vines. And that to me kind of sums up a lot of this. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you. And, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this week's um, things as well. Um, and if there are questions, I'll, I'll try and answer them. Thank you so much, Ray. And I love the imagery of passing on the farm to future generations. In fact, our friends at Line Twins Thanks. call it generational farming. And I think that's such a great summary of what sustainability is all about. So there are some questions. Um, one right. that I'll start with is what standards do we need to have to avoid sustainability being merely a marketing trope or my program is better than your program? Yeah, it's a really tough question. And it's and it's honestly not even so much are my programs better than your programs, but are your programs even real? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a, there was a, uh, piece in USA Today that was then picked up by The Economist by the guy who was the former head of sustainable investment for BlackRock. And, and he basically had a uh, kind of jolt of awareness after he left, left BlackRock. And he was saying, you know, these, these financial funds that are sort of working in a green way, a lot of it's just you know, a lot of it's just noise. It's, it's just, it's just marketing strategy. And he said, there are even some financial people he knows who are, you know, basically short selling against, you know, um, green funds or green companies, because um, it's a, it's a potential way to make money if they don't, if they don't succeed in being profitable. I think, you know, with, with, with all of this, there are always going to be with, and with capitalism, with, you know, the way we work our economy, there are always going to be people who game the system, who come up with a way to say they're sustainable when they aren't really doing the work. And it, it ends up being incumbent on, on 
you, whoever, whoever you may be who are farming or, or selling wine or, or whatever, um, I mean, the first moral responsibility you have is to yourself, obviously, to do, you know, to do what you're actually saying you're doing. Um, I think the, trick, the, the certification thing is really tricky because there's so many different certifications out there. Um, and a lot of them are, are you know, are, are great. And they just don't happen to be exactly the same. And I think that's a, a bit of a trick for consumers because they don't, I mean, it's, it's even more of a problem with organics than with sustainability because there are so many different definitions of organic out there, the EU, Australia, us, you know, organic winemaking, organic grape growing. And when I was talking about, cons, you know, sort of consumer awareness and consumer understanding, and I, you know, I thought that uh, Rob from Zaki's had a good point. It's a lot of information for consumers to digest and in a, in a realm where they're already basically confused a lot of the time. So the, mo the more clarity you can get out there, the better. And sustainable is interesting because it's seen as more of a, a, like people have some sense of organic. You say organic, they're like, hey, organic. You say sustainable, it's seen a little bit more as a technical term. Um, and so I think for the sustainable, you know, for people like CSWA, just clear awareness of what that means among the, wine buying world is, is really a vital mission. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but I hope it came close. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I will just add that I think, you know, obviously using sustainable practices is really the most important thing. And that having that sub substance behind any claims is really important. Certification obviously can play a really important role. And some of the steps we took for certified California sustainable wine growing were having our program reviewed almost an audit of our program by SES Global Services, making sure that we're adhering to international standards. We also benchmarked against the Food um, Sustainability Alliance and SAI the platform. And then basically this US project is doing exactly what you're saying, Ray, but where we're really working to come up with those common definitions and principles. So we're all singing from the same song sheet. And again, they really do um, jive with what is happening internationally in terms of what sustainability is all about. And I have seen some encouraging recent research that people do understand that sustainability is that more comprehensive mm -hmm. idea that covers, you know, more environmental and, um, and, so and social, which is which is very important. Right. You know, which, which, you know, someone was saying yesterday that organics and biodynamics, for instance, are about inputs or or non inputs in the in the in the farm setting, where sustainability hits. All those elements and everything outside it as well. It's it's really tricky. I mean, conveniently, the millennial. I mean, going back to millennials, you know, as everybody's pointed out, it's a, it's a skeptical generation that that really cares about authenticity, which means there's a little bit of a of a of a resistance to believing that something is what it says it is. At the same time, it means that people get called out when they're when they're producing bullshit. So um, you know, so I'm hoping that that. Is the case because I don't want to see sustainability undermined by you know a bunch of you know hedge fund managers who just think it's a great way to make money. Um, yeah, that often. You know, there's some great hedge fund managers out there, not just <laughs> the hedge fund manager world. <laughs> I've also seen some great research that shows that those types of investments actually do have a longer payback because you're thinking about you know the longer term, and yeah. so there's some encouraging news out there on the sustainability front. Yeah. Um, so one other question that came in, you talked a lot about crop protection as being a really important part of it. And someone asked, should labeling about pesticides, about pesticide use be mandatory? It's a, I mean, uh, that's a big can of worms. Um, it, I, I, the question of labeling in general, I mean, ingredient labeling and wine is one that's come up over and over again. And it's, 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 it, it raises a bunch of interesting questions because there are some things that are used in wine that do not actually end up in the wine itself. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I think one of the classic examples that people fight back and forth over is Velcarin, which is a sterilant, which breaks down to CO2 and water or whatever it breaks down to, which, but if you, if you, but in its natural state, you wear a hazmat suit to use it. And it honestly sounds kind of scary to me because it'll kill you within seconds. Um, you know, should pesticides be mentioned? I, or I, I would like to know personally what pesticides are used in the, on the fruit and that I eat and less is lettuce that I eat. And, um, and I'd probably like to know how the wine grapes are grown. I think, you know, it's, there are, grapes require, I mean, 
barring perfect weather. Grapes are susceptible to diseases. They're susceptible to mildew. Um, there's some question, you know, when you look at copper as a, as a, which is used in organic viticulture, copper is not, it's a heavy metal. It's not great for you either. How you grow grapes consistently and make good wine without any inputs to prevent those things is, is a uh, insolvable question that I, as far as I know, unless you look at some of the weird breeds that the Bordelais have come up with that are mold resistant. Um, and then you're headed into either, well, crossbreeding has been going on for years, but if, whether it's a GMO thing, that's another issue. So all of this is all tied together in a very complicated way. Um, I, I don't know in terms of wine, I mean, one of the classic, you know, problems with as we've seen with with SO2 labeling is you've got a vast number of people now who have completely delusional ideas about what SO2 does to you and that it causes red wine headaches. And it and it is simply not true. Weirdly, the person behind getting SO2 labeling on wine was Strom Thurmond, you know, who was one of the most backward, awful senators of all time. Um, but it's curious because everything now has SO2 labeling and it's and it is a big problem. I mean, if you are asthmatic, that's a problem, but um, but it doesn't cause red wine headaches, but you've got a consumer base out there that will take a little bit of information and run with it in a very strange way. So all that's to say, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I, I wish I did. If I Believe me, if I had the answer, I would tell you guys, and then we would all go out and we'd solve the problem. So, but uh, those are just some thoughts. That's um, great. And yeah, and I would also just mention that integrated pest management, if you're not familiar with that term, it's the basis of sustainable organic and biodynamic. And so you should look at that term. And um, we do need to move on, but thank you so much, Ray. You've Absolutely, given thank you. So many great stats and stories and food for yeah. thought. I have this image of the earth and holding it because you talked about it being this meaning of to hold. And, um, and we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you again. I was thrilled to be here and thank you very much for having me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, good luck to everyone and, and enjoy the rest of the, of, the, of the days to come. Thank you, we Thanks. appreciate it.